Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to this week um, One World Mathematical Physics Seminar of the uh, IMP. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, Benjamin Doyon uh, from King's College London. And the title of uh, today's presentation is Ergodicity, Large Scale Correlations and Hydrodynamics in Many Body Systems. And as usual, the seminar will be recorded and you will be able to watch it again on our uh, YouTube channel. So Benjamin, we're very much looking forward to your talk. Yeah, thank you very much. So yeah, first it's, it's a really an honor to give a talk to this uh, seminar series. Um, and so this is going to be about some uh, recent work that, of mine and, and collaborators, which uh, has to do with uh, hydrodynamics um, in general. Now this work, I mean, uh, I'm gonna explain some, uh, start with some basic things about, um, oh, sorry, no, it's not changing yet. About uh, some concept, one is the concept of ergodicity and present some new results there. Uh, the other is something called the Boltzmann Gibbs principle and the early equation in our equation and some results there. And if I if I have time, I don't know how much time I have to get through the whole thing, but uh, get to fluctuations. And uh, so basically, these ideas come from my studies of hydrodynamics uh, that, that uh, I've been making in the last few years, uh, in particular in the context of the. Uh, hydrodynamics of integrable systems. Although I will not talk so much about this, I decided to talk about um, slightly different things, but really it was all kind of uh, inspired by the study in integrable systems. Uh, I will discuss one dimensional systems for simplicity. Many of the results actually are valid in higher dimensions. And uh, I certainly welcome questions uh, throughout the talk. Right. So what is the, what are the objects of studies? So, um, Basically, I'm looking at uh, correlation functions in many body uh, quantum systems, although actually many results can be applied also in classical system, but uh, I'll keep on quantum systems and uh, correlation functions in uh, various states, for instance, in thermal states or in uh, states which are not, not at equilibrium, for instance, uh, with varying temperature in space or things like that. Okay. And what kind of models I have in mind? So. In principle, many of the things I will discuss will be applicable to many type of models. Uh, but for instance, spin chains or one dimensional gases or field theory and all that. Here are two examples. One is the XX spin chain. The other is some gas of particles in interaction. Okay. okay. Um, so uh, the first thing I want to discuss though is not so quantum, but uh, just a little very quick overview of uh, classical. So the, before, before going to hydro, I, I want to discuss notions of ergodicity. Now there is a very well-known uh, classical notion of ergodicity, uh, which is that if you uh, do a time average of any phase space observable in a system where there is no non-trivial constant of the motion, so nothing else except the Hamiltonian, then this is equivalent to the microcanonical uh, um, shell average, ensemble average. So the limit when uh, an energy shell goes to being very thin of the average uniform average over that shell. Okay. So this is a consequence of uh, Birkhoff's ergodic theorem. Uh, if there are uh, other concepts of emotion, this must be modified, and there's a whole theory of uh, ergodic uh, decomposition of measures that comes into play. Okay. Now, uh, this is in classical system of finite number of particles. Um, and then people have asked the question, what happened in a quantum case? In fact, this question is related to what happened in a many body case. Because in a quantum case, if you have a finite number of particles, the, the uh, phase space is somehow discretized by the quantumness. And so it kind of makes sense to actually go to many particles. This is what uh, von Neumann did quite some time ago, something called the von Neumann quantum ergodic theorem uh, uh, he obtained. And so I'm gonna explain that a little bit, in fact, in, in simpler terms than the way he explained it and in the context of uh, quantum spin chains, such as the XX spin chain. So I'm supposed now, I suppose that I have a Hamiltonian which is a sum on a uh, one-dimensional uh, set of sites of some local, ham so local Hamiltonian density. For instance, this HX, small HX, is supported on few sites, two or three sites, fixed number of sites. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this system, of course, has a spectrum, discrete spectrum with some eigenstates, and one can define a macrocanonical shell as being all the energies that are not too far from uh, some, uh, uh, some energy E. So, so all the energy between E minus and E plus. Uh, it, it is actually uh, well known, I think it's rigorous theorem that this microcanonical shell is in fact equivalent to the Gibbs uh, canonical ensemble. So the trace over the Gibbs 
uh, measure in the sense that if you take a local observable, local is important here, and you take the average with on the microcanonical shell in the limit of large L, and then in the limit where the two energies tend to a given energy E, then this is equivalent to the large L limit of the Gibbs state. And now these limits uh, exist. Okay. okay, so this is uh, the microcanonical shell. Um, now, uh, so the classical ergodicity uh, was uh, that the evolution over time of a trajectory, you know, average over time, uh, is the is equivalent to the uh, average over a certain shell. So we would like to have something like this, right? Yeah. Now there is, of course, a very simple uh, mean square ergodicity that one can write. It's kind of a two-line calculation, really. Uh, so it's not quite just the time average being equal to the ensemble average, but it's rather the time average being non-fluctuating. Um, so what is so if you take a uh, so the, in other words the the, the time average um, becomes a, a fixed value uh, in which, so non fluctuating equal to it uh, as a variable equal to its own average in on, on the shell itself so take it an energy a, a given uh, energy eigenstate n and calculate the time average square well it is a simple fact that if the energies are non degenerate and non degeneracy is crucial here then this average of the square in the state n quantum average is nothing else but the average of the of the observable a square. And so in other words, the time average uh, in that quantum uh, uh, eigenstate is not quantum fluctuating. Okay, so this is actually in, in, in the various context, this is called mean square ergodicity is kind of a simpler uh, version of ergodicity. So, uh, so, so somehow, uh, it doesn't matter how uh, how let's see it it, it doesn't matter uh, even if this variable is fluctuating as you take its time average it goes to the quantum average itself. Okay. I mean it's, it's actually it's not very interesting as an ergodicity theorem because it probes times which are much larger than the the uh, size of the system because you need to have uh, non-generate uh, energies and you need to. Time, take a time average uh, in such a way that that exponential goes to that function. So really, T is much greater than L. Now, uh, von Neumann, 1950s, I believe, uh, came up with the formulation of quantum ergodicity, which is a bit more like, uh, I mean, which should be interpreted at the more like a typicality, but he called it quantum ergodic theorem, which is a bit more, a bit better. It does have stronger assumptions and goes as follows. What it says here is reformulated in the context of quantum change. What it says is that if you have energy differences which are non-degenerate. So this thing of non-degeneracy really means is, is the equivalent in the classical context of not having non-trivial conserved quantity, right? So if you have non-trivial conserved quantities, then you have degeneracy of the energy. So you, you ask for no non-trivial conserved quantity. Okay? So uh, now if the energy differences are non-degenerate, so it's a bit stronger than energy being non-degenerate. And in addition, if two other uh, statements are true, so one is that the, that the non-diagonal matrix elements Within a uh, uh, within the microcanonical shell of the local observables, if these are small, small, how well one can give a more precise definition of how small they should be, and typically they would be dec decreasing like exponential of the volume of the system. Uh, so if these are small, and if in addition the average within a given eigenstate is not far from the microcanonical average, so because this is quite a strong statement, in fact, it's uh, essentially a statement of the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis means part of this eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. If these two statements are true, then it's actually not too hard to see that uh, for any state in the microcanonical shell, the average in time of the difference of the uh, of the quantum average of, of local observable minus the microcanonical average square that is small. Okay? So what that means is that the quantum average of the of the of the uh, a local observable in time will stay near to the microcanonical average. In fact, the way that von Neumann formulated it was to say that it will stay near for most times. So it actually you don't need to go to very large time to get microcanonical average for most time it will stay near. You can formulate it like that by saying that the, the different square between the time evolution and the microcanonical average uh, average over time that this is small. So for most time it will stay near. So uh, this is uh, interesting. There's actually a very beautiful overview of that result and what it means in, in uh, this paper by Goldschein and Bobbitt et al. Uh, 
so it is a, a certain, in a certain sense, egoicity, but of course it has uh, quite strong assumptions, right? So the assumption of a non-degenerate energy differences. In a sense, this is natural because you do want to have no non-trivial conservation laws, but you could ask, okay, what happens when there are no non-trivial conservation laws? In particular, for instance, in integrable system, there are many of these, and so this then will be true. What replaces it, okay? And uh, there's also these uh, smallness assumptions which are relatively strong. And how do you check these? How do you deal with that? Okay. So, I mean, it, it is a kind of an interesting statement, but from the point of view of uh, egoicity, so there are some assumptions and uh, one would like to go further. Another question one can ask actually is, you know, is this really useful? Uh, what can we do from that? Is this really what we want? Okay, so, anyway, so these are some questions that one can ask. Um, now, we are interested here in the thermodynamic limit, right? So uh, when I say small there, I mean small at large L, right? So this is in the sense the system is large, is a, 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 a thermodynamic limit, and as L becomes infinitely large, small becomes zero. That's in that sense, right? Uh, usually with exponential decay. So well, actually, so what this points to is that perhaps in the quantum context, or maybe more generally, what we would like to have is some kind of egoicity notion in many body systems in the thermodynamic limit. And this is actually interesting because it is in the thermodynamic limit that you see non-trivial uh, things happening such as uh, hydrodynamics, okay? So why don't we directly take the thermodynamic limit? I mean, there's ways of uh, not, uh, you know, forgetting about the volume entirely, and considering the system directly in the large volume limit. So usually a good way of doing that is by uh, considering uh, the system in terms of uh, um, states being positive linear functionals and the, the quantum system itself being some theta algebra, C star algebra with an evolution. Okay. So I don't want to go into details of this, but basically take the large end limit of the Gibbs state, okay? And consider that state as a you know, functional on observable, and ask about questions of egoicity within that context. Okay. Now, this large L limit is known to exist for every uh, Gibbs state of uh, short range interaction uh, Hamiltonian on quantum chain. It's kind of an old result, I think, by Araki in '69. Uh, the large L limit exists and gives rise to a positive continuous normalized linear functional on the algebra of observable. So the algebra here, you just think about the matrix algebra observable in the quantum chain. Uh, uh, and yeah, so maybe I, I was not very clear on that, but the quantum chain can be thought of as a tensor product of C to the N, okay? So it's, it's matrix algebra. And, uh, but of course, now as you take the large L limit, uh, it becomes an infinite dimensional algebra, algebra and you can complete it with respect to the matrix norm to a C star algebra, okay? And omega is a positive linear functional on that theta algebra. So it's positive, satisfy this condition. It is no, it is um, continuous, normalized. And in fact, if the Hamiltonian is has a translation invariance, translation by a few sites, uh, what you get is something that is actually space-time translation invariant. Okay, and x and t here is my translate of the operator a. Okay, so um, so this is uh, yeah can be extended to a theta algebra. We can take any uh, density matrix, which is a normalized uh, exponential form for any operator W that, uh, sh that is a short range Hamiltonian itself. And that commutes with the evolution of Hamiltonian. So you could have different Hamiltonian by W and H. And this is the case of, for instance, these uh, generalized Gibbs ensemble in a table model where W can contain a certain number of the cons of quantities uh, admitted by the integrable model. And it is natural to define the energy shell there as being a slight modification of that state. Now that state is like a fixed energy. It is space-time transition variant. It's like a, an eigenstate, but you can modify it by inserting any element of the sister algebra itself. So local elements, say local observable or the extension, their, their uh, Cauchy completion to sister algebra. Uh, I like that. So omega B dagger AB over omega B dagger B that defines the state psi and this is a natural candidate for what we can think of as a state within the energy shell, but not necessarily a, a fixed energy state. Okay. So, okay, so this is, so we can go to the thermodynamic limit and ask about uh, egodicity there. So what happened at large time within these days? Okay. Benjamin, so, 
Can, can yeah. I ask a question? So yes. wh why do you say that this is the counterpart of energy shell state? Yeah, so I my, my this Psi is a state, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so Psi is a state. So satisfy yeah. these properties. Now that is not space time okay, yeah. transition variance is the only thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, let's say my interpretation, uh, because it's a state that is uh, not too far from the state omega, so close enough. So in a sense, it's a bit like energy shells, it's close enough to it. In oh. fact, it is a modification by just a, a local observable or element of CISA algebra. So it is within you know, the, the, the genus representation of the state omega, right? So if you take a state oh. with a different temperatures, then it is very far. Uh -huh. And then uh -huh. in that in that sense. Okay. Say. Okay. So it's a local modification. That's yes, the, yes, the local point. modification. Okay. okay. Thank you. I mean, you, you, of course, you can ask questions about more general states and all that, but it's just just for the discussion. Uh, it is convenient to consider these states, let's say. Other questions. Okay, so uh, now there are some known results for these states. Um, uh, it is known by result of Raki 1969 that correlation functions, connected correlation functions of local observables of this type at time zero that, the, that these connected correlation functions decay exponentially. So if you go in X, positive or negative, it will be exponential decay that's result of, of Raki. And then by uh, the result of Lien, Lieben, Robinson 72, uh, you can also go towards uh, time evolution. So it is known that if you time evolve, an operator, local operator like AXT, then that operator would be effectively supported up to exponentially small terms on a light cone around the point X. So there will be a light cone that grows with certain velocity uh, with time T, and there's a maximum velocity, which is called the Lee Robinson velocity. And because of this Lee Robinson result, actually, it is uh, possible to show that correlation functions uh, decay. Uh, exponentially whenever you are outside of uh, the light cone. Uh, so when X is greater than uh, VT, Poisson velocity. Uh, the more precise statement, uh, you know, so there is a, uh, there's a VLR such so that uh, for every velocity that is uh, greater than VLR, uh, the correlation function uh, for A and B uh, decay. So for every A and B, there's a C such so that the correlation function is smaller than that. Now this is for outside the Lycon, so in space-like regime, this kind of old results and quite well known. It's been, of course, extended to various situations. This is for short range quantum spin chain is being extended to more kind of longer range. So when the interaction decays, not exponentially, or, but algebraically. So here short range, I'm thinking about exponential decay of interactions, okay? Or even a Hamiltonian with a finite number of uh, whose density has a, a supported on a finite number of sides. Okay. Now, what is not so known is what happened in time, and in time is what we would like to know if we want to do ergodicity and time averaging. Okay. So within the light cone, what we can say, of course, is that there's a bound of this correlation function by the basic operator norms, so matrix norm of these local observables. But uh, of course, physically, we know that a bit more should happen. And physically, actually, what we expect is that these correlations decay in time as well, at least for most directions, right? And that's really, uh, uh, I mean, the different notion of that, if it's exponentially, exponentially decaying in time, this is called mixing in, in statistical mechanics. Uh, but at least some decay in time should occur. And it's a bit more difficult. So, uh, so we have some results about that, something which we call uh, almost everywhere ergodicity, and it's about time averaging. So it's about really what's happening uh, within this light cone. Now, why is this result interesting? So I just explained the result, and why coming to this result, the, the point was to come to some kind of a description or, or some kind of understanding of hydrodynamics so that leads to some high hydrodynamics. But for, for first now, let me just explain the result. So uh, it is a kind of a good result in the sense that it is about uh, time averaging. So this over line there is time averaging. I think I had it at the beginning of the slide, my first slide. So this is time averaging from zero to capital T, whenever it, maybe I come back to this. Sorry, just have that. This is the time averaging there, okay. Um, so what I'm saying is that I'm time averaging a local observable, evolved in time and displaced in space by VT. Now this is, on the lattice on the quantum chain. So really I should take the um, integer part of VT to be on a given lattice side, okay? But that is matter too much. So time averaging of uh, along a certain line, a ray in uh, space time, 
Okay. And uh, the statement is that uh, in the strong operator topology for the GNS space, the Gelfand Namak single space, that time averaging, averaging converges uh, and gives the average in the state times the entity. And this happens for almost every velocity, not, not necessarily for every one, but for almost every velocity. In other words, this time average, it can be, can be replaced by the ensemble average inside any correlation function, okay? in particular in the two-point correlation function like here. So time average here is replaced by just the ensemble average. In other words, the connected correlation function time averages, time average vanishes. vanishes. So the connected correlation function vanishes. Okay? Now, uh, so it is not an exact ergodicity because it does not necessarily happen at time zero, at, at x equals zero, just period on time. But it happens for any velocity as near as you wish to uh, the velocity zero to period in time. Right? In fact, so the, there's, there's a, okay, and, and, and this is true for every uh, quantum chain with short range interaction. There are no conditions of non degeneracy of eigenstates. There's no eigenstate here. I've already taken the infinite volume limit. And there's no condition of uh, smallness of matrix elements and all that. Okay. So it's quite a general result. Of course, that means that it is true uh, also for, um, uh, for chain which are not interacting at all, in which case it is a bit of a trivial statement, but it is true for interacting chains, in which case it's a less trivial statement because we know that the operators do grow in space. There's an icon operator growing in space. And we're seeing that here actually they, they become thin, the operators grow in space, but they are not very thick, so they can grow, but then as you time average, you know, almost everywhere, you get nothing but the identity. Um, actually, this can be also written for arbitrary frequency. So it's not just a godesty, but a godesty at every frequency. For every frequency, this is true for almost every V. Right? And which velocity it is true that can depend on frequencies. And uh, typically one would expect this to be true for every velocity in non, in non trivial interacting uh, quantum chains. Um, in fact, one can write it in a different way, which is actually more useful from the point of view of uh, getting to how to dynamics. Uh, you can, instead of almost every velocity, you could do a space time average, right? An average over time, an average over space, and take the large space time cell. And these large space time cell, then, because you have almost everywhere on velocity, the integral, uh, essentially the integral with space that you get. Uh, or integral of velocity that you get is going to give the result itself. So this is equal to the uh, ensemble average. Okay. So here we have a space time average equal ensemble average, which is some kind of uh, egodicity. Um, yeah, so, okay. So uh, it does lead to this mean square egodicity, again, almost everywhere with respect to velocity, in the sense that the average quantum average of n power is the average of the, of the old power n. So that that ensemble average is non-fluctuating. There's no quantum fluctuation or even statistical mechanics fluctuation. My state omega is, is a Gibbs state, statistical mechanics, right? But actually this is not fluctuating anymore. So uh, that would mean that, you know, in your statistical mechanics, when you sum over all possible states, well, every one of them, when you take the ensemble, the time average goes to a given number, essentially, which is uh, the, Gibbs, uh, the Gibbs average. And uh, the state psi that I was introducing and trying to interpret that as a state in the energy shell, well, then I get, maybe in my interpretation is because I get a nice result here, which is that the time average or uh, yeah, the time average of local observable evaluated in that state within the energy shell is the ensemble average or the microcanonical average or Gibbs average of that ensemble. So this is really a statement of ergodicity like uh, like von Neumann wanted to have in a way, except it's almost everywhere in space time. So you need to have a large, infinitely large system and you go in space time. And here we do use the fact that there is a space time transition invariance. Um, it necessitates only extensivity. That's actually an important concept. So you don't need to have uh, small matrix elements. You don't need to have non-degeneracy and all that stuff only extensivity of the system. So the system needs to be extensively large so that you have uh, space-time variance and with local interactions or short range interactions. This is extensivity. Uh, so it says that operator gets thinner within the light, the LR Lycone, Lieberman's and Lycone, 
And it's actually, it's a consequence of a von Neumann's ergodicity theorem, which is that when you average powers of the unit tree operator on a Hilbert space, uh, you project onto its uh, zero, its uh, eigenvalue one. It's just a consequence of that, actually. The point is to construct the right Hilbert space of the type of the GNS Hilbert spaces, and then to analyze what happened with these projectors. And then that's sort of that. Okay. So, uh, what can we do with this ergodicity? Well, we know that within the, the, uh, the light cone, what should happen physically is that there's some kind of hydrodynamics that should emerge. At least one thinks that this is the correct description at large space times. So here we just say that some time average or some space time average uh, become non fluctuating and agree with the, the ensemble average. Okay? And uh, it turns out that actually this is sufficient to get to uh, some expressions, so to get to, get to prove certain general principles of hydrodynamics. Okay? So what happened within the light cone in your two point function? Okay? So in particular, the, the, there's of course a lieber benson velocity that tells you, you know, correlation decay beyond that, but inside may not decay. Now, what we're saying is that if you time average correlation, they always go to zero, but they may not go to zero very fast. Now, what are the, the true relevant velocity for the large space-time uh, correlation function? Uh, well, they are the hydrodynamic velocities. Uh, so they are defined, these hydrodynamic velocities are defined in a certain way. So typically, if you look at the correlation function in the many-body system, uh, you can imagine that by saying, well, you 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 have your 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 system, which is maybe air, and then my vocal cord uh, are vibrating it. Okay, that modifies the system, and uh, that creates waves. And these waves then hit you know the eardrum of somebody else, and this is the strongest correlation you know, between the vocal cord and the and the eardrum. So these strongest correlations are carried by waves within within the body system within the gas. Okay, this is a general principle. So we would expect that there are certain velocity like sound velocities that carry the, the strongest correlations uh, uh, within the many body system. Okay. Now, there are different uh, uh, general way of writing these principles. Okay. Um, so this is what I just said, so you know, due to traveling waves. Okay. There are ways of writing these uh, in a precise fashion uh, and then you know, trying to extract some, some results out of it. Okay. Uh, the first concept behind that is the concept of a concept of quantities. What, so what are these waves, right? Like the pressure waves uh, that, that the vocal cords create? Well, these are uh, waves that carry uh, conserved quantities of the model. For instance, uh, the number, if the number of particles is conserved, that is associated with pressure wave. So there's a density of particles. There's a current of particles, which is the momentum in uh, um, in Galilean system. And these satisfy a conservation law or continuity equation. And it's basically this continuity equation that gives rise to some short propagating waves. In the XX model, for instance, there's a spin that's conserved, there's the energy that's conserved. There are actually infinitely many in the XX model because it is integrable. And they have a seated current. And these are also particular observables that satisfy a conservation law. Okay. So one would expect that the direction or the, the, the strongest correlations in space time of two point functions will be uh, controlled by propagating uh, conserved densities with their stated currents. That's what we would expect. Okay? So, this is, you know, these conserved quantities or these, these conserved densities here are uh, uh, things that will uh, guide, that will control what happens at large space time or condition functions. Okay? Now, um, in order to get to something to precise result about that, it's actually uh, important to do uh, uh, to go to the uh, earlier scale, so to go to large scales in space time in order to, to reach. Uh, is that a question? Yeah. Okay. In order to, to get to this uh, kind of a, a principle of propagating waves. At small scales, actually, a lot of things can happen. You can have a lot of small oscillations, a lot, a lot of microscopic, microscopic physics can happen at small scale, but at large scales, and then you would expect something more precise. So here is a way of doing the large scale. This is based on, on this uh, ergodicity result, basically, that said that if you do a average over space time, that comes back to the, uh, to the um, ensemble average. Okay? So here we, we do uh, not just not exactly an average over space time, we do average over time, but we take the Fourier transform in space. 
with a wave number, which is here kappa over t. So t is large, the wave number is small, so the wavelength is large. Okay? So this is uh, looking at a limit where time is large, make an average over time, and wavelength is large. In other words, it can also an average over space, right? Because if your wavelength is large, you sum over all x, you also have average over space. Okay? Uh, so this is a Fourier transform at small, at large wavelength and large time simultaneously, written in a particular fashion. Okay? Now, actually, this limit precisely uh, is well, it is not zero generically. Okay? So this is not just the space and average because you do, you're doing a Fourier transform here and all that. So you, you take uh, kind of the, the leading part of this space time average. So it's not zero. Uh, it is bounded, certainly. One can bound that. It doesn't diverge, right, for sure. Uh, actually, I don't know if the limit exists in general. Uh, there's no proof of that. But since it is bounded, one can define something called a um, Banach limit or generalized limit. So you can, you can attribute to this a, a number. And if the limit exists, that number is the limit. You can do, for instance, multiple averaging uh, um, limits, you know, like average many times so that it, it, it exists and all that. But so for now, we can assume it exists. If not, then it's a generalized limit. Okay? So there is a result for that thing. So this is the Fourier transform two point function. Okay? And what does the result say? Well, the result says that uh, indeed, this two point function of arbitrary observables is controlled by uh, conserved quantities. Okay, so I express the result, then I explain it essentially in the other side. Okay? So uh, this is something called the boltzmann gibbs principle. If you look at two-point function of uh, local observables, the boltzmann gibbs principle tells you that, well, this two-point function is controlled by waves propagating between these two, and these waves are carried by conserved quantities. Okay? So the result is that this exact object is exactly equal to the same object where you project the local observables, whatever they are, onto the space of extensive conserved quantities admitted by the model. Okay. So there's a certain Hilbert space where these local observable lies, and within it, there's a subspace of conserved quantities, and you have to do this projection. Okay. So what are these spaces, and how does it work more precisely? Well, it's uh, relatively simple, in fact. Uh, everything is based on the, the Hilbert space induced by the, the um, essentially the susceptibility. So the space, uh, the, the sums over connected correlation function over all, all x's. Okay? This thing is positive semi-definite, and so it can be made into a proper inner product if you take the equivalence classes. In particular, of course, because I sum over all positions here, I can translate any of the observables and get the same result. So the equivalence classes are essentially the translates. Okay. So the space of equivalence classes under this product can be thought of as a space of extensive observables. It's, you know, you sum over all of x's, so you don't care about where they are. Okay. So that, uh, now one can construct a Hilbert space from that inner product. Uh, on this Hilbert, it, it's a bit like the, the GNS Hilbert space, the gets max Siegel Hilbert space, but it's sum over x, but it's a similar construction. Uh, on that Hilbert space, the microscopic time evolution uh, acts actually as a unitary operator. That's because the, the state is actually time, uh, time invariant, invariant on, the, on the time translation. Okay? And then you can define the concept quantities as the set of all elements, here capital A, in that Hilbert space, which are invariant on the time evolution. This is just the concept quantities. Okay? So this is a kind of a uh, a complete definition. So this is actually also a Hilbert space. Uh, Q is a closed subspace, Hilbert space. So there's an orthogonal projection. And that, that's the orthogonal projection that one uses for the, the uh, boltzmann gibbs principle. Now, what is non-trivial, this, this uh, time averaged uh, Fourier transform two-point function as a function of these local observables, actually is a function of the elements of the Hilbert space for these local observables. It's a function of the equivalence class only. So it can be seen as a binary form on the Hilbert space. And uh, by the way, here I'm assuming that AB are, are Hermitian. In fact, I should put some daggers there and daggers there if, if they're not Hermitian okay, to make it Hilbert space, but that's just a detail. Uh, 
so so uh, so S is well defined on the Hilbert space, and, no, and so it makes sense to make a projection. And in particular, all the local conserved quantities, and even the quasi-local ones that one construct in integrable system, are part of this. In other words, the equivalence class of any very local quantity QI is part of this space. And so that means that you have to project over these local conserved quantities. But uh, there can be, you know, this is a complete space, so there can be there can be more than the one that you are used to. Then the problem, of course, of hydrodynamics is to see what are all the correct uh, uh, conserve, uh, extensive conserved charges that are admitted by the model. Okay? So physically, this is the projection onto the um, uh, the uh, emergent degrees of freedom at large space time. The emergent degrees of freedom are these uh, extensive conserved quantities, essentially. Okay? So you reduce uh, your degrees of freedom to all possible local observables from all, local, all possible local observables to just those that are part of some, some uh, Hilbert subspace. Okay? So this is, this is called the boseman gibb principle and represents the fact that if I put an observable here and one there, the correlation function is controlled by uh, conserved quantities. Here is delta n, that was in terms of normal mode, but it's controlled by these qi's, by this uh, Hilbert space. Okay. So, this again is true for every extensive uh, uh, um, quantum chain, but of course, it becomes non trivial if you have an interacting quantum chain. And one would expect that the space q on which you project uh, will be finite dimensional. If you have a non-integrable quantum chain, for instance, it will be space spanned by the energy, maybe the number of particles, right? If you have a gas or maybe the spin of a chain, and nothing else, right? Yeah. While in integrable models, it's gonna, it is known to be infinite dimensional because you can construct by the usual construction of integrable models an infinite number of local conserved quantities, which are all part of that. It is known to be infinite dimensional. It is not known exactly what the full space is. It is conjecture for what it is. It's not been calculated, but it is known to be infinite dimensional. That's probably the most uh, characteristic difference between integrability and non-integrability, the dimensionality of that space of emergent degrees of freedom. Okay, okay so that's kind of a general result. Uh, uh, so correlations of arbitrary local observables are controlled by correlations of conserved densities or conserved quantities, you know, elements of some human space. Uh, so you just have to calculate correlation functions of, of uh, densities for your transform large time to get correlation functions of other things. You do need to know how they project the projection. That is uh, not trivial, but this is possible. Uh, the space of the extensive conserved quantity here is un unambiguously defined and complete. It's complete because here the space. So you don't, in hydrodynamics, there's always a question of uh, what, what, how you, are, are you sure that you have taken all the possible uh, um, uh, conserved quantities that you have all the possible emergent modes. Where here, there's a precise definition. In fact, it's, it's a refinement of a concept that was introduced by Prozen some time ago, the concept of pseudo-local charges, uh, which are charges that, that grow uh, linearly with the system size. In fact, it's equivalent to that Hilbert space. Uh, how is this proven? In fact, is this almost everywhere a godicity that guarantees that when you calculate, um, uh, when you calculate uh, this uh, um, Fourier transform large time, large wavelength correlation function, that the result is indeed something that is time transition invariant so that you can project over the conserved quantities. So almost very egodicity, particularly the fact that the fluid cell average, the average over a large space time region converges to the ensemble average is, is actually the crucial element for getting to this. And I think this is the first time the Boltzmann-Gibbs principle is actually proven in interacting systems. Something Boltzmann-Gibbs principle has been around for a long time that people have discussed for a long time, but I think this is uh, the first kind of general proof. Now, can, what can you do with that? Perhaps even more interestingly, is to know that not only any local observables projects over conserved density, but to know how these conserved densities propagate. Okay? Um, certainly, if you have a two-point function of conservation, you can write you can write conservation laws, right? So dtqi is the plus dxgi equals zero. So this is true, uh, certainly by by uh, basic macroscopic calculation. It's just a conservation laws 
of uh, densities and currents. Okay. Now one can take that equation, which is always true, pass the fluid cell averages, construct this S Q I Q J and S G I J. So these two these two elements, J I Q J, and then use a projection for the second one to project the current on the densities in order to get a self-consistent equation. Okay. So the result is that for these uh, long time, long wavelength averages, this uh, uh, the, the long time, low, long wavelength two point function of conserved density satisfies a linear equation. This is called the linearized Euler equations. So what it says is that the derivative with respect to kappa, so derivative with respect to the Fourier mode essentially, uh, exists derivative exists and is equal to what is i times a sum of a certain matrix called the Fleur Jacobian of the S for a basis QK of elements of the space of conserved quantities. So the derivative can be written as uh, elements within that space itself. So this is an equation for this set of uh, correlation function. Okay. What is the Fleur Jacobian? Well, it's nothing else but uh, the, the projection of the current, which is not itself a conserved quantity in general, right, onto the set of conserved quantities. Right? If the current is itself a conserved, you know, conserved density, as it sometimes happens, like the current of particles is the momentum, and the projection is, is trivial, otherwise the projection is non-trivial. Right? And that A represents projection. The sum here is a sum over a basis. Now, because we have kind of a a finite, log, finite dimensional local spaces. Uh, the Hilbert space is actually countable dimensional. And so there's a basis, it's kind of a simple structure. So there is a basis in principle. Uh, and so you just have to sum over a basis and, and, uh, and that's, uh, so that's the result. Okay. Now, explicitly this flux Jacobian can be written in terms of charge and current susceptibilities. In other words, uh, the overlap between current and densities and current current these are kind of integrated two point functions of susceptibilities where the A matrix is just BC inverse. That's just doing the projection itself. And uh, I think so, there are not many rigorous uh, derivation of linearized Euler equation. There's one actually by Spohn for the hard rod gas, where you have an equation not of similar type of that. Uh, uh, but in quantum chains, I think this is, uh, I mean, I think it's the first time that this is actually shown in generality. Okay, so this is the linearized Euler equation. Now, why is it an Euler equation? Why it is a linearized Euler equation? Well, the intuition behind that is relatively simple. Okay, so uh, for the intuition comes from Euler hydrodynamics. Right? So here it was our correlation functions in, uh, in Gibbs state, right? So everything is homogeneous and stationary. Okay? But uh, you can derive this equation by considering a state which is varying in space time, well, let's say homogeneous, but making a small disturbance in the state and seeing how disturbance evolves. And the disturbance will evolve according to the Euler equation. Right? And that's how you can get that type of uh, linear Euler equation. Right? So uh, how does it work? Well, uh, you know, if you have a, a system, here's 2D, but okay, same thing is in 1D, where the state varies slowly in space time, then according to general principle, you would expect that if you look locally, then as in so-called fluid cells or mesoscopic regions, the system will look like it will have thermalized, will have maximized its entropy. But maximized entropy according to all the available conserved quantities. So it will look like Gibbs ensemble, but with all available total conserved quantities QI. So the Hamiltonian, the momentum, number of particles, and all that. Okay? But uh, the way that it maximizes entropy will depend where you look. So they may be different Lagrange parameters, so different Gibbs states, but they are Gibbs states. Okay. So you can construct, so you can calculate within these local Gibbs states, the average densities and average currents. And hydrodynamics, or hydrodynamics is nothing else but the statement that these local densities and currents satisfy the continuity equation. Because they do satisfy it at the microscopic level, but this is a slightly different equation. It is at the macroscopic level. And it says that what you have are space-time dependent temperatures that satisfy an equation, which is a continuity equation. So the, the main non-trivial thing about hydrodynamics is to, have, to see that you do have space-time dependent temperatures that locally 
the state looks like that. In other words, average of any local observable will be averages within that local state. Okay? Once you make this assumption, then this is the Euler equations. You can convince yourself in ordinary Galilean system that this brings comes back to the standard form of the Euler equations, but this is the general form for any many-body quantum system, supposedly. The thing in this equation that is non-trivial is to find what are what is the set of all conserved quantities that you have to put in there. Then you have a big set of equations. This is your equations. Okay? Now this is the equation for the betas because all these densities, you know, the local state are driven by the betas, by the, the generalized temperature. Uh, but also can be seen as a question for the average density themselves because there's a bijection between the betas and the density by uh, this mapping, by this definition. Okay. So these are earlier equations. Now, if you now think about uh, correlation functions, what you want to think of is a small disturbance of the state and how they propagate. So you just linearize that equation. When you linearize that equation, what you get is a propagation for small uh, linear disturbance that involves the derivative of the currents with respect to the density. That's exactly nothing else but flux Jacobian, the way that I had written before as a, as a B, C inverse. This, uh, this is obtained just essentially by a change of variable from uh, the average currents to average density, essentially. So you write dj d beta, d beta dq. Right? So the flux Jacobian can be seen as coming from the linear version of Euler hydrodynamics. Okay? So you get then that equation, which is the same as uh, the linear hydrodynamic equation that I was writing there on top. Okay? And, uh, or it can be seen as coming from projection of the currents onto the conserved quantities. Okay? And that's how it actually it can be proven. Okay? So this is, the physical interpretation is propagation of uh, waves uh, uh, on, on top of a uh, fluid that is otherwise homogeneous. Okay? Now you can, in principle, diagonalize this A matrix. And if you do that, what you get are the normal modes and within the spectrum of A, you get the effective velocities. And this is what describes the, the directions where you're gonna have the strongest correlations, like the sound wave and the sound, the sound velocities and all that, okay? Now in, uh, so in general, I don't know the structure of this A matrix. Of course, if it's fine, if you have a finite dimensional space of conserved quantity, this is just like a three by three matrix. And then you can diagonalize it. It is diagonalizable and it has uh, real eigenvalues one can show. Uh, and then uh, these eigenvalues are interpreted as uh, velocities of propagation. If it is an integrable system, then this is infinite, infinite dimensional matrix. And as it turns out, integrable system, you actually have a continuum of sound modes of uh, eigenvalues of this matrix. Right? Now, uh, so one can work this out uh, quite explicitly in, in various situations. And uh, I mean, the, perhaps the, the, one of the interesting uh, family of system to work it out is indeed integrable systems. Uh, now, there are not so many rigorous results for integrable systems, but uh, one thinks that the set of conserved quantities in integrable systems are actually, uh, well, this Hebrew space is spanned by the, the densities of Bethy roots. It's a bit hard to write it down quite explicitly, but uh, you can still do some uh, kind of computation using thermodynamic beta and SAS and all that. And you get an explicit form from this for two point correlation functions of conserved densities in any integrable system. Uh, this explicit form involves quite a few objects, like part of the thermodynamic beta and SATs. So that, that's, uh, it, it, it will be, I mean, uh, quite a bit more to explain, but uh, in words, there's an object that represents the, the uh, density of beta roots from the beta ansatz in the large volume limit. There's an object that represents the occupation function. There's a dressing operation that kind of modifies the, um, uh, the eigenvalues, one particle eigenvalues of the charges by the interaction. And there is an effective velocity that can be calculated from uh, TBA quantities. Now, uh, the density of beta roots are the scattering basis for these excessive conserved quantities, the effective velocity actually form a continuum. So somehow the Spock Jacobian, which is an infinite dimensional matrix here, has a, continu a continuous spectrum. That's what we expect. 
And this formula can be calculated numerically. I mean, there's few kind of integral equations to solve, but one can get uh, some numbers for that. Uh, also can be derived by, by form factor techniques. In the XX model that I have described, actually this formula is very simple. Uh, essentially N in the XX model is the fermionic occupation function because the XX model can be solved by uh, fermionizing free fermion. Uh, and rho is also the same thing, it's a fermionic occupation function. The dressing is trivial, so these h of p are just the one particle eigenvalue. For instance, if you take the spin, it's just one. So every fermion carries value one. And the effective velocity is nothing else but the group velocity for sine p. And so you get a result for this from hydrodynamics in the XX model. Now, um, yeah, so this is kind of a, a general result application of, of uh, in integral models, application of, of the, the, the general formula for uh, linearized, linearized Euler equations. Right? Um, yeah, so, okay, so one thing that is important, which I, which I was kind of saying here, it is important to do the time average and the space average. Well, in the proof, it's important because then you can use ecodicity essentially, but it's actually important in practice. Because if you don't do that, then the result of linearized Euler equation just is not correct, just does not hold in general. Right? So you cannot just take your uh, two-point function of, uh, of density, a bit, a bit like I wrote here. So two-point function at given space-time point without doing appropriate averages over some fluid cell. Right? So one illustration of this is you can take the XX model itself uh, and calculate the two-point function sigma three at different space time point okay, along the way. Now in the XX model, this can be solved by, by fermion, by, by mapping to a free fermion. So this is just a weak theorem calculation. It's actually a very simple calculation, of course. And what you find is that if you do this calculation, there are two parts in the formula. There's one part which is reproduced with, by the uh, linear, linearized Euler equation. And there's another part which is oscillating. Okay? So there are oscillatory terms in general in coefficient functions. And if you don't do your time average and space average, they are there and they remain forever. I mean, there's a one over T times of slight return, right? Okay? Uh, so it is essential to do fluid cell averaging. In fact, it's possible to do fluid cell averaging in different ways. And one would expect that you could do the, instead of doing Fourier transform and all that, you could do the much simpler averaging over space and time, directly averaging over space and time in some kind of square cell. As long as your space and time are large enough, this capital T capital L large enough, um, but kind of s smaller than the macroscopic scale, so where you put your point in space time, but bigger than any microscopic scale. This can be, this can be done quite explicitly in the XX model. Uh, uh, if for the general rigorous result, you actually need to do to take this L and T uh, of be, being kind of essentially macroscopic, but in the limit of, of a zero macroscopic then essentially. Okay. So this is uh, uh, for two point functions. Okay. So, there, so that means we, there are some very general and rigorous results for coalition functions, which have to do with early equations, linearized early equations and both McGill's principles so two point function of arbitrary observable project into conserved quantities with a known way of projecting and conserved quantities or conserved densities propagate according to linearized Euler equations. Okay. Now, uh, so it'd be nice to go further. This is just two point functions. Of course, the ergodicity result is valid for any number of points, but it is much harder to get precise large space time scale results for higher point functions. Although there, there are some results from uh, nonlinear uh, uh, kind of uh, nonlinear perturbation of other equations. Um, there, there's a, I wanted to maybe um, uh, go to this one. Uh, so there is a way, in fact, of going beyond uh, to higher point functions and even to states which are uh, inhomogeneous, conscious of time. So uh, well, I will skip the other part. Okay. Uh, and this is, of course, not rigorous, but uh, one would like to ask about you know, many point coefficient function of this type where you have uh, many local observables at many space time point and you want to look at large space time uh, distances. Okay. Uh, so uh, of course one can ask that already in a homogeneous system, 
but uh, one can also look at systems where the initial states is not homogeneous, so out of equilibrium. Okay, so everything that I was doing to now was at equilibrium. So a typical way of doing that is to take this density matrix, which has varying chemical potentials. So we're like varying temperatures. Now, in general, that's going to be hard, hard to access these correlation functions, and there's no, not, no expectation of universal results and projection over a smaller set of degrees of freedom. But if the scale at which the initial temperature of your state uh, varies, if the scale is large, and you look at large distances in space and in time, then you could expect to have something that is more universal. In fact, what you expect is that the earlier hydrodynamics is going to be describing this. Now, these caution functions would be expected to decay at large L, but then if you multiply by the right power of L, which is essentially the, the ballistic scaling power, L to the power n minus one, where n is the number of observable, then you would expect to have something finite, or at least something non-zero. In general, that can be some generalized function, perhaps delta function, but at least in integral models, it's, it's something that is finite and non-zero. Okay. So the question is, uh, can you reproduce uh, um, many point caution functions in uh, kind of that type of uh, uh, slowly varying initial state? Right? Now, it turns out that th there is a, a conjecture for producing such correlation function, uh, and it is by replacing all the fluid cell average. So there's an A bar there. That, this is our fluid cell average on large, on kind of mesoscopic cell by random classical variables, uh, Q, Q check here. So every fluid cell is replaced by random classical variable. And these, the average the proper quantum average in your quantum model is replaced by, um, by a, uh, uh, by uh, essentially, well, uh, an average on these random variables. Right? And by projection, by a reduction of number of degrees of freedom, by the projection result, essentially, what you would expect is that an arbitrary local observable average over space time will be replaced by a random variable, which is itself a function of these random conserved quantities. So essentially, the, the, the proposal is that you can reduce the calculation of correlation functions in general to the calculation of correlation functions of conserved densities. Every random variable, uh, uh, um, uh, local observables, should be replaced. Should be replaced by something that depends on the conserved densities themselves. And what? How is it? What is the function of conserved densities? Well, by the ergodicity theorem, that everything kind of collapses to the average on on uh, the so the time average are ensemble average. Essentially, that will be the ensemble average of these local observables within a state described by inverse temperature, which are just such that uh, uh, the average densities take the form, uh, the value that the random variable takes. Okay. So here, this is the average, uh, um, the GG value of the conserved density in some random fluctuating temperature, which is such that is equal, that average is equal to uh, the random variable Q. Okay. So this is a mapping between the Q and the beta. Okay. So that's, of conjecturally reduced number of degrees of freedom. What is the measure that you should put? So the measure that we propose is a, an extension of uh, something called the macroscopic fluctuation theory, ballistic macroscopic fluctuation theory that we call it. It is very, very simple. Excuse me, simple. What you say is that your random variable fluctuates in space-time with an initial measure that describes exactly that initial state. So it is simple to, to write a uh, probability measure that describes the initial state. This is nothing else but the relative entropy of Q with respect to the uh, uh, initial values of the density. So it's a, it's a relative entropy. Okay? And all you have to do is evolve this initial measure according to the earlier equations. Okay? That's the problem. So, so you have a fluctuating uh, classical variable in space time, which are fluctuating in space at time zero, just so that you give the exact initial state and evolve over time according to your early equation. So this gives a theory. So this is kind of a, kind of a, uh, a macroscopic fluctuation theory. So a theory for correlation functions uh, with a particular measure. And you can evaluate this large L uh, limit 
by uh, doing appropriate saddle point analysis, then it becomes then uh, calculating uh, averages within fluctuate uh, within a classical fluctuating variable. You can do saddle point limits and all that. Okay. Now uh, we've checked, so it is based on the principle of a separation of scale. So not only uh, so is the reduction of number of degrees of freedom. So not only on average, uh, 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 local observables are function just of the concept of densities, but actually on fluctuations. Oh, okay, I skip that. Um, uh, what is interesting is that from that we can uh, we obtain uh, interesting effects, and one of the effects that we find is the appearance of long range correlations in states which are initially homogeneous. So we've we've tried this in this uh, for a certain model, and the model we've taken is the simplest model possible called the hard rod model, but the same would hold for quantum chains, for instance. We, we put the initial state in a in homogeneous situation where there are more particles in some region and less particle at the region, and then the state evolves according to hydrodynamics. And what we've observed is that there is a long range correlation that appear later on in time between uh, observables that are at the same time, but separated by uh, uh, large distances. And this is goes against, of course, the intuition that you get from equilibrium. Remember that at the beginning I said, correlation function vanish outside of a certain light cone, right? So here, this is no longer the case. If you are out of equilibrium, you evolve from a state which is homogeneous. You look at later in time, correlation functions do not vanish outside of the light cone. They are uh, non-trivial and they have a, so some earlier scale. And the theory of, of a fluctuating random variables actually gives you prediction for what this function is. So uh, it's, a prediction is a bit too complicated to write. So sorry, this is not uh, very explicit, but uh, it's a bit complicated to, to write the whole formulas. But then we did some numerics where we calculated caution function far in time from initial inhomogeneous uh, uh, densities. We, uh, we calculated the density of particle Two point function of densities of particle later in time and far in space, essentially like like in this uh, picture there, and we rescale them with the right power of the scale, the macroscopic scale. So this correlation function decays, so we like one over L, so we multiply by L, and we get a function, and this is a function as a function of x, the macroscopic x uh, um, uh, distance, which agrees very well with uh, the numerics. Somehow this this theory of fluctuating variables gives large scale correlation functions, which are indeed find, found in the uh, numerical uh, calculation. Yeah, so sorry, so I, I uh, stopped there. So basically, hydrodynamics gives a lot of general principles that can predict and produce asymptotic of correlation functions. Uh, so there are some few uh, ex uh, rigorous results and other not rigorous but exact results, in particular, some new long range correlations. Uh, um, uh, so there's there's a kind of a lot to do. I mean, for instance, this nonlinear response. There are some nonlinear response results from Euler hydrodynamics, uh, which one can access from this last theory that I described, the basic MFT. Um, it would be nice, in particular, in this last point, to understand uh, more rigorously what is the space of conserved charges, for instance, in integrable system using a quasi particles, and to see the difference between integrable and non-integrable models. But uh, I'll stop there. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Benjamin, for this uh, very interesting talk. Um, I now leave uh, <clears throat> the floor to the audience for questions or comments. Actually, I think I have one uh, to start. So a uh, very naive oh, one. But, so, Marta, oh, there is one raised hand. Oh, sorry, I didn't see that. Oh, yeah, yeah. sorry. Please, y Jan Mandrich, no. please go ahead with your question. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for the very nice talk. Uh, so uh, first a question on understanding. Um, you mentioned the space of extensive conserved quantities and uh, could you just explain uh, why the definition of uh, this space, so why you call this extensive? So, uh, yeah. Yes, yes, it's, 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 yes. Uh, of course, it's just, I mean, the definition was a bit formal there. And, and the real reason why it's called extensive is it's a um, it's another theorem which I didn't show, but um, okay. So the, the first thing is that because it's the space is defined that way, that way you integrate over all of, all of x essentially, right? So uh, the equivalence classes that you get, you know, the things that 
that give the same the same value for the new product are you know for all possible x's so the a you know with any of these translate okay so somehow you know if you have an extensive conserve an extensive quantity which is a sum over all x's of a density where you can add you can you can shift by any amount that quantity of course you get the same sum or you can add derivatives and you get the same thing so there's this this invariance you can add derivatives okay and so this is that equivalence class you know, this is the set of all things that will give the same total sum the set of all things that gives the same total sum so in this end they, they are they are excessive but actually the the proper fuller answer is that um yeah so i'm not well organized if i had a pen i would write but uh, let me say it is that uh this cube space is uh, but in bijection with the space of uh, elements operators which are such that you calculate uh, the 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 average of the square minus the square of the average okay this that these operators draw maximum at the maximum like the volume of the system okay so these are extensive these are these are the pseudo local charges that were introduced i had this by by prosen actually it was that definition that he was using and later on i've shown that this is actually uh, isomorphic to this space so yeah Thing. Okay, thank, thanks a lot. Uh, I would have a second question, but maybe if somebody else wants to ask first. Go ahead. Yeah, yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Then uh, the second question would be uh, that you showed this, uh, you had this result on this almost everywhere ergodicity. Uh, and uh, does it apply also to integrable system? Because you mentioned that there, the, for instance, uh, in this hydrodynamic picture, you have that the sound waves form a continuum. And I thought yes, somehow. Yes. Yeah, sorry, this is a good point. Yeah, yeah, so this apply completely generally, uh, even in the system. But so what happens in those, on these sound waves is where you have the strongest correlation, but still the correlations decay. So in, in, in typical integral system, you, you still expect correlations to decay and, the, and they decay fast. And, I mean, they decay and so that the, the integral is uh, the, the average over large time is going to be zero. Actually, typically, it's for most RV, typically it's, it's for all V. I mean, there's an integral interacting system, integrable or not. You expect that there is no velocity where where that does not hold. Other way, I, I wouldn't know how to show that. Really, I, I don't know. Yeah. Ah, okay. So, so what what is not uh, the, so the null set here is somehow rather something, uh, let's say, uh, oh. pathological, not not something physical. Yes, yes. I mean, I suspect that you can construct models like pathological in, in various ways. Where there will be a non-zero null set. So I mean, this is a completely general result, right? This is, it's a for every short-range quantum chain, you can construct things that are very strange, that are, you know, even like just not interacting at all. The 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 zero velocity is going to be part of the null set, right? Because there you just have something that oscillates in a finite space. Now this, so because it's it's so such a general result, you have to uh, kind of allow for that. But interestingly, it doesn't matter. Then how the hydrodynamic structure still hold. So the hydro structures are kind of very, very general. They don't really depend on any chaos or anything like that. They don't need the system to be of any type. The only thing that will change in the hydro structure, depending on the dynamics, is the space of extensive charges. That's the thing that changes. That's the thing that non-trivially characterizes the dynamics. Otherwise, the structure is the same. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. That was clarified. Thank you. Other questions? Can I ask a quick question related to this? Yeah. So, you know, this about this exceptional V. So, is it like possible that, I mean, this holds for any V for like non integrable system, non trivial system, and things like that? Yes, yes, indeed. So, I would expect for, for non trivial interacting system, most of them, that this will, that this oh. will hold for every V okay. in R. Okay. I think so, but, would be uh, but very, very difficult. Yes, yeah, this is very difficult. And I, I mm -hmm. also, uh, it doesn't seem to be uh, very relevant, at least for the hydro structure. I guess mm -hmm. it will be relevant if you want to have a weaker definition mm -hmm. of fluid cell averaging or something like that. If you want to have a more a tighter definition of all, of all the stuff, then you will need that. So that would be interesting, actually, to see what's the consequences of, you know, if you do have that and, and yeah, and of course, but proving that is, is much more difficult. Thank you. 
actually I also have a question about this result. So, um, so it looks very, I mean, extremely general, but still it's for one dimensional system, right? Uh, you, you, you said. Yeah. So, so where so, is one yeah. dimension playing a role in? in, in no, so, so actually, I, 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 so some of the results there can be extended. So here, the city can be extended to higher dimensions. We, so we've done it also for, for the, the cubic lattice. Okay? And uh, the, the one thing that is that we need there is that it, ha it has to be in the rational directions on the cubic lattice. So any almost every velocity in every rational directions, because we want to have powers of unitary operator. So, but still it doesn't matter. That still allows hydro projection to, to occur, actually. The, it's, it's sufficient. Mm -hmm. In fact, that there are different, there are different uh, um, Almost everywhere I got these results in higher D. You can also like integrate over a plane and then go to all velocities and all that. And so, you know, looking at rationality is, is sufficient. So there, there's a bit of, of, a, of a constraint you need to go to look at rational direction, but otherwise, it's the whole. What we don't have in higher dimensions yet, although maybe some of it can be done, is the linearized Euler equation itself. Mm -hmm. So that, that one we don't have in higher dimension. And there, there was the necessity of having a current and the one dimensionality there was important. So I, I'm not too sure back there. But uh, I mean, uh, I guess you can, I mean, uh, okay. So maybe it sounds uh, way too naive, but you always have, uh, I mean, these conservation laws, I can imagine you can also write them in, yeah. in a higher dimension. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So the, the, the space, you know, that space, that can all be mm -hmm. done in an arbitrary dimension mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. has been done and the, the relation between extensive and that this is, this is done in the higher dimension. So in projection holds out in higher dimension, indeed, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Yes, yes. Thank you. Um, are there other questions or comments? Yeah, I have a question about this both from Gibbs. So uh, it, you said that in a not integrable system, you expected this, uh, the space of to be projected is just finite dimensional. But uh, in order to have a rigorous example for this finite dimensional space, uh, so you, you have to prove that some, some non-integrable chain has no, uh, no conserved quantity, which is not only local, but which is like quasi-local. I mean, I, yes. I, I, it's, it's, I have in mind a beautiful result by my young friend, Naoto Shiraishi. Yes. He proved that in this XYZ chain, you don't have any local conserved quantity. Yes, but, yes, indeed. But that's yeah. not enough. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> actually, it's a good point. And I'm sorry, I should have cited yeah. I know his results, yeah. actually, which mm -hmm. I think very, very interesting. And, I, and I, when I listened to his talk, I, I, I had the hope that this maybe <laughs> could, it's not, but as you say, this is not enough. Mm. Okay. It's, okay. It's not enough. So there may be more, and you have to prove that there are not more. But uh, I'm, I suspect the techniques that he's using can, uh, you know, hope, I hope that they can be extended to uh, look at uh, um, uh, the, the, the more complete space of extensive uh, conserved quantities in the end, because it is uh, countable dimensional space. Every element of that Hilbert space can be written as a convergent sequence of really local elements. So you need to extend his technique to not ask for zero commutator, but to ask for a small uh -huh. commutator. Yes. Uh -huh. And that this goes to zero in the limit. Hmm. That's interesting. <laughs> do you it's think nice it's thing. doable? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. It would be nice to do. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. And, and then Thank you would you. have the full proof. Yeah, 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 that would yeah, yeah. be like yeah. really, really that's good. That's very nice. That's very nice. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, other questions? Okay, doesn't seem to be the case. So uh, let's thank again Benjamin for this uh, very interesting talk and for the discussion.